In the last example involving colleges and university enrollments, we used the standard error definition and then we used the computer output which gave us variance and we solved for standard deviation and then plugged that into the formula for standard error and lo and behold we have our standard error which is 4326.227. All right, so now we want to take that same idea but kind of reverse it. So on this one, I gave you variance, which gives you standard deviation, which gives you standard error. You kind of go one direction. So in the next example, I want to give you standard error and have you work your way backwards. All right, so we have this data set that we learned about in chapter three. You have a group of students that wanted to study U.S. exports. They get a random sample of countries and they have their outputs, um, computer output, descriptive statistics output right here on the right. And I didn't give you all the countries, but there are a few of them. The first thing I want to know is what is the sample size? So you can see right here, I've got a little orange box around it. That's the sample size. It's called the count, right? So it's the frequency, it's the size of your sample. So n is equal to 19 for us. And then particularly intriguing is the bit in this little green box right here. It's called the standard error of the mean. But standard error, SE, standard error, has a formula that is s over the square root of n. Well, it's technically sigma over the square root of n, but we don't have sigma given to us because this is not a population, this is a sample. So we have to use s over the square root of n. All right, but s over the square root of n, well, I know the n part, it's 19. I just figured it out here with the orange part. So that's 19. And I know the standard error is 8.76, so I could set the equation equal to 8.76. And then I could solve it for s. So if you put 8.76 in here on the left and square root of 19 on the right, what happens is you want to multiply both sides by the square root of 19 to make it go away. So when you do that over here on the right, they cancel, they divide away to 1. But you have to do it to the left-hand side as well to keep the equality, the equation balanced. So I grab a calculator and I type 8.76 times the square root of 19 and I get 38.14, or excuse me, 184. There's a typo right there, 184. And there we have it. There's the standard deviation. So it's the opposite of what we did above. The one above, you got variance, variance gave you standard deviation, you just plugged in and you're done. And we knew sample size right from the problem. So that was a straightforward substitution. Example four, it's kind of backwards. You're kind of using a little bit of algebra to solve for s, right? So you put in the numbers you know and solve for the s, which is the part you don't know. All right, last example here. So we want to look at this example, which is in the United States, the year each coin was minted is printed on the coin. We want to find the ages of a coin, or to, excuse me, to find the ages of a coin, you simply subtract the current year from the year printed on the coin. So, for example, if I know that a coin was pr printed in 1974 and it's currently 2017, then I would take 1974 minus 2017, I would get 43. Right? Or if it was 2000 that was printed and it's 2010 right now, 2000 take away 2010, or excuse me, vice versa, 2010 take away 2000 would get me an age of 10. All right, now we know that that's right skewed. Everybody hopefully see that right there. We know it's right skewed because most coins are, you know, within the last 20, 30 years of minting. And then as you get older and older, it tails off, right? It becomes kind of a right tailed thing because there are very few coins out there that are very, very old. All right, we know the standard deviation and the, and the, mean, right? We know the mean is 12.2, we know the standard deviation is 9.9, .9, but we're in trouble because we cannot determine the probability of a single penny, and the, the key in there is the word single. We're talking about one randomly selected penny because that is not a large enough sample size to overcome the skewing, right? You know it's skewed right. You know the age of pennies makes this kind of shape. And having a sample size of one is less than 30. So we can't find this probability. We can't do anything because we don't know the shape, right? There, I think I typed that up a little bit better. So we cannot calculate any probabilities because our sample size, which is n equals one, is less than 30. And that's not large enough to overcome the skewing of the distribution. 
to ensure a normal shape. In other words, condition three is not met. All right, so let's suppose instead that we have a sample size of 40. Now are we okay? And the answer is sure, yeah, you're fine, right? Because we are gonna meet conditions one and two. So condition number one, that is random, was given, and actually so is number two. They're given to you right there at the beginning. It says random and independent, right there. So they are both given. So that's great. So then we have to only check condition number three. Condition number three says it has to be normal. And in order to ensure normal, you have to have a sample size large enough or it has to be given that it's normal. Well, we weren't given that it was normal. We were given that it's right skewed. So we need n equals 40 to be bigger than 30, but it is, so we're okay. n equals 40 is greater than 30, so distribution is normal and condition is met. Great, so we verified our conditions. We were given one and two right there, random and independent, and the distribution was normal because n equals 40. All right, so then how can we describe the sampling distribution? Well, the sampling distribution would be shape, center, and spread. The shape will be normal, we just proved it. Shape is normal, the center, will be the mean, right? So here, let me write this up. Shape is normal. We already proved it up above. The center would be the mean of the X bars, but that's equal to the mean, but that's equal to 12.2. We were told up above that the mean is 12.2. And in this case, the unit is years. So let me just throw that in. It says this is the age of pennies. It says right there that this, the mean is 12.2, right? So that means that my mean down here is 12.2. And then the hardest part, the spread. Spread is the standard error, right? The standard error of the X bar. So the standard error of the X bar is sigma divided by the square root of N. In this case, we actually have sigma. So that would give us a standard error of 9.9, .9, cause that was the sigma given right up here, 9.9. .9, and we would divide that by the square root of N. And N for us is 40. So I'd grab my calculator and I would take 9.9, .9, divide it by the square root of 40, press enter, and I get 1.565. So that's the standard error right there. All right, so now that we know how to describe the shape of the distribution, we have to answer another big question. And this is gonna kind of lead us into what we're gonna be doing for chapters nine and 10. So this is a really important point right here for part C. All right, suppose that you get a batch of 40 random pennies. Keep in mind, that's the same distribution that we just talked about right here. So we know how that should be distributed, normal with a center and a spread. And you get that the mean age is greater than 16. And that has a probability that is very unusual of 0 0.0076. So what are some possible reasons that could happen? And so that's what we want to talk about for explanations. What are some purpose or some reasons behind why you could be getting such a rare result? And there's really three big types that you want to pay attention to. Now, the first thing that you could have is you could have a biased sample. You know, for some reason, the, you know, this person just has old pennies. Maybe this person is a penny hoarder and we knew that. And when we pulled up the pennies from them, um, we knew they were penny collectors, so they've got a lot of old pennies. Um, perhaps I told them to bring old pennies to class one day or perhaps, you know, whatever. Perhaps they lied, right? Perhaps they're lying about, you know, how many pennies they have or whatever. That's all biased sample, right? So the sample that you have is not truly representative of the population. So uh, perhaps um, also the person, perhaps the person lies, right? Non-response error, response error, so response error, non-response error, all of those types of things. 
response bias, non-response bias, those all fall into here for when you watch chapter section 1.5. Sorry, bias. So response bias, non-response bias, sampling bias, all of those ways you can bias your, yourself. Those could all be possible. But of course, if they're possible, then everything we did is all garbage. You can't talk about the center. You can't talk about the spread. It's all worthless because biasing your sample creates such huge problems for yourself that you won't be able to surmount them no matter what. So that's not really very useful for us mathematically to think about. So we kind of just always assume we don't have a bias, right? Because if you have bias, you've got big problems. So what we'll do instead is we'll talk about some other options. So bias sample, big problems. Then that means that it could be a fluke, right? Sometimes things that are random just happen, right? So this would be stuff happens, right? Sometimes stuff just happens, right? By random chance, right? And Getting that high average, that high of 16 years, could just happen by random chance. All right, so by random chance, what I just typed up, just by random chance, rare stuff can occur. Now keep in mind the probability of this fluke is what we found right here. It's that 0 0.0076. It's super rare, super unlikely, but it can happen. And I just wanted to make extra crispy notice of the fact that this would be very, 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 very bad if we did have bias samples. So I'm just going to make a little note here that we'd be in big, big, big trouble um, if this happened. We'd have to throw out all of our data. Now there's one other option. So we assume this one's out because it's so terrible. So that leads us to this one, which is just, hey, it's rare stuff happens. Or there's one other possibility, which is that the parameters were no longer true. The, the parameters are the thing about the population that you assume to be true from the problem. In our case, that mu was 12.2 and sigma was, what is it, 9.9? .9? Yeah, that sigma was 9.9 .9 right here. So those things we assume to be true are maybe no longer true for us, or maybe they never were true and somebody did some data calculation wrong back in the day, but that they are no longer or maybe never were the case, that would be that the parameter is no longer true. So that's the third option. So perhaps the mint has changed its coin practices, perhaps those parameters were never those values, who knows, right? So those two, these last two, are really the two that we end up choosing from more often than not in chapters 9 and 10 and 11. So this right here is these three options are the three options available to us in chapters 9, 10, 11. We throw out the first one because if the first one happens, all hell breaks loose. And that leads us to two and three. So we figure out whether the chance of a fluke is low enough that we say, no, I don't think it's a fluke. I think it's that the parameters are no longer true.